Hello and welcome to Theatre Reviews with Paul Severn. I'm here at the No Card Theatre to see The Motif and the Cue. Back in 1964, the great classical actor Sir John Gilgood directed Richard Burton, who at the time was probably the most famous film actor in the world. It was a production of Hamlet on Broadway. In The Motive and the Cue, the National Theatre production which has just opened in the West End at the Noel Coward Theatre, we follow them from the first day of rehearsal to the first night of the play. I'm going to stick my neck out here and say this is one of the best plays ever written about the rehearsal process. And I hope that doesn't sound too boring because more than that, thanks not only to playwright Jack Thorne's ability to create drama, but also Sam Mendes' direction and the acting of Mark Gatiss, Johnny Flynn and Tuppence Middleton, and the set design of Ez Devlin, this could be as close to theatrical perfection as you can get. Keep watching and I'll tell you why I reached that conclusion. But first, please, like, comment and subscribe. Jack Thorne has talked about the way rehearsals are used to explore the text and find a way to the truth of the characters and situation. And truth is what art needs in order to succeed. As Gilgood points out in this play, the actor needs to share with the audience something they can both believe in. Now, it can be a disadvantage to use well-known people and actual events because we may think we know the characters and what happened and that may in turn get in the way of the play's attempts to convince us of this particular interpretation of them. So for a moment, let's think of the motive and the cue as not about Gilgood and Burton, but simply about two people who clash because of their different approaches to acting, but who learn to respect one another and work together to create a production that tells a truth about Hamlet. So the older man comes from an emotionally buttoned up generation who at 60 is finding himself left behind by the new trend of so-called angry working class drama and working class actors like Richard Burton. Gilgood values the verse, which he speaks with a precise, mellifluous voice. And, here's the rub, is considered to have been the finest Hamlet in living memory. The younger man is a great stage actor, potentially the greatest of his generation, thought by some to be the new Laurence Olivier, Gilgood's rival, because of his rich voice and commanding muscular presence. He's become a Hollywood star, but still yearns for success on stage. However, his alcoholism and lack of discipline hold him back. The two are yin and yang. Seen like that, it could be any clash between an older and younger generation, or between a fading light and a bright young thing, uh, between great past achievement and great future potential. In this rehearsal process, we see Burton struggling to understand Hamlet. He sees the prince as a man of action not unlike himself, so cannot fathom why he dithers so. We see Gilgood offering many ideas or notes, uh, but unable to resist showing off his way of speaking the lines. This is a most interesting aspect of the play. It says that the worst directors tell actors what to do, while the best work with their actors to find the truth. Burton initially reacts badly to this to-and-fro approach and, in moments of his worst behaviour, mocks the old thespian. Gilgood behaves mostly with restraint, but is a master of ironic comments. Oh, you only wanted my opinion so you could disagree with it. And when he does let go, he lets off the sharpest barbs. Mark Gatiss and Johnny Flynn are both Tremendous. Uh, Mr. Gatiss speaks with a musical precision. He carries himself, as the critic Kenneth Tynan said of Gilgood, like a folded umbrella. <laughs> In fact, he's so convincing that it almost seems a shame for Mr. Flynn, who otherwise would be the undoubted star of the show with his stabbing, forceful vocals, his frenetic bonhomie, and his vicious bullying, all underpinned by emotional pain. Tuppence Middleton is also splendid as Elizabeth Taylor, uh, combining vivaciousness and sexuality with self-deprecating humour and a down-to-earth quality. As Devlin's set follows the same principles of creating truth rather than imitation. The rehearsal room may not be totally naturalistic, uh, there's less clutter, but this brightly lit, 
airy space with no obvious ceiling suggests the truth of an openness where ideas can flow. Similarly, the set for Burton and Taylor's living room is not lavishly furnished, but a huge dark red wall convinces us that they live a life of luxury and decadence. The viewing aperture opens and closes in a rectangular shape of a proscenium arch, um, revealing sets, but at times closing them off so that one or two actors are left alone at the front of the stage against a black backdrop for key moments of thought or conversation. Hamlet, of course, is driven by his betrayed and dead father, so it's hard not to see the relationship between the two men in the motif and the cue as that of a father and son, a love-hate relationship in which they ultimately reconcile to release the Hamlet that is within Burton. Finding the motive for Hamlet's behaviour and the cue for releasing the passion of his performance. This leads to Johnny Flynn performing a stupendous version of To Be or Not To Be. Um, on the night I saw it, it received a spontaneous and well-deserved round of applause. I can't fault any aspect of Sam Mendes' production. I give the motive in the queue five stars. I hope you enjoyed this review and found it useful. If you did, please like, comment, and subscribe to this channel so you'll be the first to know about my future reviews. And if you uh, want to read my reviews, go to theatre.reviews. You can also follow me on Threads, X, Mastodon, Instagram and Facebook. Thank you for watching.